Hey everybody, I'm Sean Robinson. I'm Carson Gruba. Welcome to the Living the Line. And uh, welcome Sean. to a new feature. <laughs> yeah. Such a new feature that we don't even know who's going to introduce it or what's it called. <laughs> oh, we do. We do we need a name for this, huh? We do. Uh, well, let's let's let the audience uh, vote on this because I had to wake up early <laughs> to take Tori to a doctor's appointment. And my brain's not enough uh there to make a funny name okay that, that relies on uh alliteration or assonance or anything like that right yeah no definitely uh heavy on the alliteration heavy on the accident assonance and hopefully not having a word like formalism that only half the people who in the audience know uh, what it means <laughs> yeah it was uh so anyways what we're gonna do is I've always I I have enjoyed uh, the music reaction genre, and that was always uh, an inspiration for this channel. And I've never figured out how we could do live reaction to books because that doesn't make sense. Uh, but I do like the idea of live reaction. Holy and shit! I was, look at this splash page, Carson. <laughs> yeah, you're like reading it out loud to each other. Like it just doesn't work the same way, right? Uh, so. I do like that idea, though, and I thought that we could turn that to reacting to videos of the greats drawing and seeing what we could see from them. So we yeah, need a name I, for that. <laughs> I think it's a fantastic idea. And uh, when you mentioned it to me, all I could think about was how when I got COVID finally in December, the only things that I did for the, the two days that I had horrible body aches is lay there watch Mon Ben, and then watch some UFC. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's like my whole life. Right there. <laughs> right. But you you watch the old UFC, though, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like the first the first season of Mon Ben, the first two seasons of Mon Ben and uh, the first 10 episodes of uh, of UFC. Uh, basically got to the first <laughs> the first few uh, Don Fry fights. And uh, and then I was just like, there's no nothing's ever going to be better than this. So no, you got to watch that. <laughs> That fight with Don Fry and that gigantic Japanese dude from Pride, where they just sit there and they hold each other's head and they do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, this isn't a channel about mixed martial arts. So uh, the the video actually that inspired this, and I think anyone who watched the channel is pretty familiar with the fact that I'm obsessed with Sergio Topi and have got Sean uh, on board yeah. as well. I was watching Sergio Topi drawing, found a video of it, and I thought this would be a, a great first one. So you, you want to just jump in and do this? Let's do it. Let me see. But I just wanted to see what we could see watching a master draw because we've tried recreating work. Yeah. By re-inking it. But that's always a finished work. You can always already look at that light grip on the pencil, even when he was kind of hovering, like he's almost ready to make a mark. He's got that really, really light touch uh, there, which you'd expect for somebody who's about to block in something. Yeah, and having the pencil, well, I guess he does kind of have it up. No, see, he put it down where the back of it's in his palm, which, yeah, is I, I have a tendency to grip the pencil up like he started out. But yeah, watching the fluidity of the single line, uh, kind of like the chasing of that. I think this is something that we both knew already, but we learned more from the yeah. AI is the like mess block in. Yeah. You're essentially making noise for yourself to respond to. It's not just like you're trying to finesse or get capture the actual individual line at the first moment. Yeah. And so that's obviously his approach. But, you know, when you get to the end of the video, you'll see he had a vision all along. So you're blocking in that. Yeah, foggy first go. So that you can start hallucinating the details into it. Right. Um, but I think the interesting thing about what he's doing and what really captivated me, I think he's going to about to go do it here in a second is watch how many times he goes back to the perimeter shapes and redefines <laughs> them uh like how important like because he made that a big kind of like totem shape that's the right. combination of the two subject matters seemed to be more important to him than any of the other things that are going on in the image right <clears throat> so his his uh, meta composition is there prior to anything within that initial frame 
This yeah. is this is the equivalent of finding the right piece of uh, granite for your sculpture. Yeah, he's got like the major <clears throat> shape in place. So hmm. now I was going to carve away at it. Also notice like the, uh, like you, you were saying when you were sick. Okay, there you go. See how many times he went over that yeah. circle at the top there, that arch. It was like more important to him than any of the details. The details he sat there, just one line, right. pop, 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 never goes back. But those uh, contours he goes back to over and over. Yeah, notice his, his uh, he refined the arch as he was going. He's essentially building it out a little bit more to the upper left. Yeah. Like each arc of the pencil built it out a little bit more there. So it's that it's that the obsession like there he just made the shoulder bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And you see him uh yeah, refining that arch too. So his uh, nope, now we got a whole bean around the whole thing, right? None of that's necessarily going to be in the final right image, but he's it's that connection of those shapes that might even have like an empty space between them at some point. That he spends more time on than the details, which really blew my mind. Is he going to ink directly over this? No, it's not inked, unfortunately. Yeah, I, was I, gonna I couldn't say, find this... any video of him inking. But this gives you a sense of how he must ink. Well, yeah, right. I mean, it, it, he's building up so much graphite, though. It don't, I don't get the feeling that he would work this dark if he was going to, unless there's some type of contrast adjustment happening in the video. I don't get the feeling he would work this dark if he was going to work on top of this graphite. No, but it gives you a sense. Like, I'm going to go back here. Watch him go around the corner on that thing. Boop, 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 boop. And now right. all of a sudden he doesn't give a shit about the pattern. <laughs> and it's just filling in value and then coming back. And then he hits all those circles. Boom, 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 boom. And so it gives you a sense of like, th this is what I suspected from Topi. This doesn't right. look sped up to me either. Is He just draws fast. That's unbelievable. And yeah, that loose grip. Um, and then I think you learned while you were sick and with the, see, he refined that arc again, goes back to it. Um, you learned about the, how light he was drawing versus the, the darkness later on. Right. Right. Yeah. That was specifically the, the big takeaway I had from the use of the AI. And the, that was the first major piece of drawing that I did after that sort of realization and just realizing that like that earlier lighter stage that like the lighter you could possibly make it the more you could read into those initial marks look at he's messing with that arch again because now it's imp <laughs> it's important to that black shape that he just created there right right like the way those two boundaries butt up against each other is more important to him than any of the details huh <laughs> And I, I had that revelation too, and I talk about it in another one man review I did. That basically combining with what you've exposed me to with silhouette, uh -huh. he's basically trying to develop iconic silhouettes first. And if that <clears throat> lands, then the details inside don't really matter. Your brain's still going to read it as like there's a cartoon horse head. Um, and then he can fill it with all the realistic rendering he wants, but that immediate registration with the cartoon brain is right. always there with his work. Uh, yeah, he's somebody who has a huge diversity in terms of how abstracted he allows different forms to be on a per panel basis. And so it's very intriguing to see him just tearing away at it here with no reference. And okay, so and I hadn't even realized that's a mounted man until right now at the second... But he knew it all along, right? right? Like yeah. he obviously knew this was a head and a guy on a horse. Right. And that the combined shape of those two things is the see, key to what he's doing. You could see the abandoned uh, little mini arc between the man's head and the horse's head there. Mm hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and also that lighter line that I was saying in between, like what would have been like the shoulder piece and the horse's foot. There's that light right. line that defined the totality of the shape, and then it will just be right irrelevant to the end. So that's something that I try and teach my students a lot is um, sometimes you're drawing the things that connect things. Right. It's not going to be in the final. Oh, he's refining that damn curve again. <laughs> uh, that's the one thing that he touches more than anything else, right? That's how yeah. essential that is in his mind. But like right there, okay, he just drew over. What's he drawing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah um 
but he just touched his hand over that line that's going to go away. And I, I think it's understanding those like drawing through types of connections like, oh, draw the leg invisible through the back of the horse or whatever. Right. Be where it comes out the other side are very important. And I think some of that's just construction stuff for him. The, the paper looks so light um, and he's on a light board. I would or he's got some type of light source underneath. I would bet that this is a preliminary drawing that he's going to just pop something else on top of, which is why he's feeling free to, you know, work so darkly. That could be. Yeah. I, I definitely think like in the books that I have of his, I see evidence of pencil underneath the inks. Ah, so okay. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure he switched his process. Also his color work. I'm not sure. Right you know, what the process is for that. But yeah, I wouldn't, this is not paper you would ink on. Uh, it's also quite possible that he just got asked to do a demo right. for this interview. And so he's sure. just, you know, hacking something out here. Well, look, look at that, like uh, deciding when he's going <clears> to, <throat> you know, put the, put his lighting, but also like draw across the form there. There's just a slight bit of uh, angling to the stroke to follow what you would expect the, the, the the curve of the horse's garb there and the underneck and everything. Yeah. That's the, one of the things that's always mystified me about Topi is, is he will do a lot of directional mark making that follows the form, but then like uh, at the bottom of all that guy's chain mail, as he turns the corner, he doesn't really turn right. the corner. He just keeps going. And it like, out. That yeah. doesn't work, but it works for him. It, it that, That's like a very characteristic Topi brow uh, there. I noticed that those that three page short story that you did that was a uh, Topi inspired mm -hmm. that you gave one of the characters that deep brow that eats up the eyes. Yeah, it's important to his work. I'm curious now too because when we were when we were talking about him, you had talked about uh, like the consistency of his faces and how they seem photo referenced and stuff like that. I'm curious <laughs> after you see this. Like what if you think that he was using reference like like legitimate go pose in this or is he the well, type of guy that can kind of just have a photo of the thing and then it looks to me like right kind of just make it up from any I mean that whole I, horse and everything like yeah I have to say talk, our talk with Alex Ross has really convinced me that some people have abilities that are so different from mine being the egotistical person that I am that it's difficult <laughs> for me to reach you know to, to to sort of understand it in the same kind of way um like you know he, he I, I think he's probably falling into the alex ross category of somebody who has a tremendous amount of things that they can pull from within and then chooses to reference for explicit things when they have a purpose for doing so yeah okay so that looks like the end of him drawing there um yeah okay so that's the end of the drawing and then now he's just showing off you get a sense of how big the artwork <laughs> is <laughs> right and also he's definitely working on a heavier board so i think that was just a demo mm -hmm. um but yeah anyways i think this is super instructive to have the, it, it's it's something that you know we don't have preceding a certain point in time and so we've we've lost like if you could get a video of alex raymond and to see how he held the brush or Stan Drake, like did, right. did he hold, did he hold the pen like this or did he hold it, you know, like this yeah. while he was inking or where did he right. change over? Um, so I think that's, that's a really interesting thing. And uh, people let us know, you know, is this something that's worthwhile or is it just obnoxious? <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked this video lots more guys. If you hadn't been talking, <laughs> if it was, yeah, yeah. let Topi talk. It's an Italian with no translation. Trust me, you didn't miss out anything. Unless you speak Italian, then, you know, we'd love right, to know well, what could, he said. We could see everything he was saying with his hands. Yeah. yeah because he's exactly. Italian. So I did you learn anything from that, John? What did well, you hell yeah, I did, man. That was fan, <laughs> uh, fantastic. Well, I mean, uh, like I said, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm peering into his brain a little bit. It seems like he's more of an Alex Ross figure, somebody who uses reference when he needs to, he feels like he wants to reinforce, but somebody who obviously didn't need to. I mean, he's just pulling that out there, right? I mean, yeah, that's what I, it looks I, like. Or like J.H. Williams, even more than right. Alex Ross, because 
Alex, I, that was the craziest thing about talking to Alex Ross is he was like, you see his sketches and you're like, we both asked him like, well, why do you take photos then? And well, I just like it, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think, I think you're right that this is just one of those. <laughs> Damn you good guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I, 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 very interesting to see that he went straight for the silhouette um, at the very beginning. Uh, I think you're exactly right about that, that like the looking for the iconic representation that reads at any and every level immediately and ha diving yeah. that in, uh, diving into that as a as a first start. I mean, that's I think that's fascinating and a really key component to this. Yeah. And then that that like. That you should be willing to take liberties with anatomy uh, even with like, if you look in his work, like he'll do spot on linear perspective, but there's other times where he'll almost flatten it out in like a cubist way and it still reads perfectly. So I think that's been the big revelation for me with his work is his willingness to go between iconic and real and, and smush them together. Yeah. Um, and I think Dave McKean has that same thing. You know, those are the two guys I can think of that the external proportional forms are wrong in terms of like mm -hmm. accurate anatomy and stuff, but they lean towards the iconic. So that lets them fill it with as much realistic detail as they want. And then your kind of brain merges the two in this right. magic mix is pretty special. So yeah, I, as I, he was developing that face, that the, the, even that one face just by in isolation by itself had that exact mix that you're talking about, like the brow yeah. delineation and the eye, um, you know, pushing back from that. Um, and then the nose, and you could take that and you could flesh that into a realistic drawing if you had some perverse dire, desire to do so. And instead, yeah. he's created this cragged, exaggerated outer edge to it. And this iconic uh, shape with the flattened uh, male happening underneath. Yeah. Yeah, but he can he can pile in as much kind of like realistic textural rendering as he right. want. And it doesn't matter how clogged it gets or not. Like it's just or how much it doesn't matter. Even like you're saying, the horse has like all this kind of spatial information on it. He could and he does. He'll drop that at times and flatten things out, but it doesn't matter. And so that freedom to like pile on realistic rendering and texture and all this stuff haphazardly just for like rhythm and design purposes is that's right. pretty special so you, you, can you think of an earlier antecedent for that um other than um you know like in painting like Klimt and Chile uh, oh Klimt for sure and yeah. and it seems like they really got it from you know Muka and um Beardsley and people like that who are working in a more of a design uh motivated illustrational <clears throat> realm yeah to some extent I think they I think it's also I think Japan uh, hmm. deserves a lot of credit because even Muka and, and people like that, like the entire European scene got influenced. I mean, talk about Cassatt and Van Gogh and Matisse and all those right. people. You'll see the evidence of them having been exposed to Japanese woodblock clearance and stuff for the first right. time. And yeah, so I think uh, Klimt really, to me, seems like a shot out of nowhere, honestly, like the way he clumps stuff together in, in the similar way Topi does. Right. But it's very hard to not see the Japanese influence in those yeah. things to me, like the kimonos with the patterns on them, sure. the ways that, that that would show up in, in the Yukio prints and things like that. As if you're I, seeing through something to a flat pattern underneath it, like here's the silhouette and then beneath it. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really good call. Yeah, it's just the flatness, the color, the, the like the Japanese are so good at composition and you, you can really see when when Japan opens back up in what 1856 or whatever we go right. over there, and America forces them to open back up. Um, but all of a sudden you see in the art world the impact of this other tradition coming in and just fucking everything up right like oh my God, abstraction is uh essentialized rather than iconic like there's just all these different things going on like calligraphic rather than than stiff and iconic and yeah flat shapes and things like that so i think that's if we had to go that's as far back as i could speculate okay. but klimt seems like the big one because klimt is is really here's a lump of shit just full of pattern and there's a person underneath it right and then there's the face emerging from it that's like you know, perfectly rendered and has the rounded off sides falling away from the light and everything. Yeah. 
It's and if you look at Klimt's uh, landscapes as well, it's the whole painting's just like you're staring at a bush up close and it's all just like dots. And then there will be like two branches and like one little house in the back, you know, but it's a, just a chunk of trees. So I think probably that as well is something um, really interesting, though. So yeah. I hope you all like this as a feature. Yeah. We would love a name for it and uh, let us know if we should keep doing it or not. Yeah. And uh, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe and hit the bell, please, so Carson can finish reading his books and let me go home. <laughs>